Okay, we continue on with our study of the kingdom protista, now with the plant-like protists. But if you'll recall, we've studied the animal-like protists, the protozoa. We've studied the fungus-like protists, the slime molds and water molds. And now we're going to take a look at the plant-like protists, the algae. Like plants, plant-like protists, the algae, have chloroplasts. That means that they can photosynthesize. That makes them photoautotrophic. Remember, autotrophic means they feed themselves. They can make their own food using the energy of light. That's where the photo comes from. So photoautotrophic. And some have cell walls. Not all algae have cell walls, but some have cell walls. And those that do have cell walls, some of their cell walls are made of cellulose. There are other algal species where there are cell walls, but they have cell walls, but they're made of silica instead of cellulose. But this is a plant-like characteristic. To have cell walls made of cellulose is very is is plant-like. That's what that's what plants have. Most algae are unicellular or colonial, and we we're going to refer to those as the microalgae. You'll notice that that's what we're going to be looking at first. So you can divide up the algae into two groups, microalgae and macroalgae. So we're looking at the microalgae first, the ones that are unicellular and colonial. And some are considered truly multicellular. And those are the ones that we're going to refer to as macroalgae. So micro means small, right? And macro means big. These multicellular algae are big and they look a lot like plants. And there are some that actually classify them with plants because they are multicellular and that's a characteristic that all plants share. The whole kingdom plant day is multicellular. So like plants, algae are photoautotrophic and they're using, some of the algae are using the same pigment, chlorophyll, to absorb light energy, to use that energy to make food. So a pigment is anything that absorbs certain wavelengths of light. Chlorophyll is one kind of pigment and that's uh, a pigment that's widely used for photosynthesis. But there are other pigments, too, that are used for photosynthesis, and we see that a lot in algae. Not so much in plants, but a lot in algae. So there are different kinds of chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, chlorophyll C, um, and I just want you to be aware of that right now. But there are other accessory pigments, too, what we call accessory pigments, along with chlorophyll, oftentimes that um, allow different different algaes to absorb different wavelengths of light. That's what these pigments are doing. Uh, so for example, when you paint, you're using different pigments, right? And those different pigments are different colors. They're different colors because they're absorbing different wavelengths of light. What they don't absorb, they reflect. And that's what you see as color. The color that they reflect, the wavelengths of light that they're reflecting, is what you see as their different color. So we're dealing here with just the visible spectrum, the visible light spectrum, the wavelengths that, that algaes and, and photosynthetic organisms absorb are from the visible spectrum. In other words, the different colors that you can see. And you may be familiar with uh, Roy G. Biv red, orange, yellow, blue, in, uh, blue, indigo, and violet. Those are the colors of the visible spectrum. Roy G. Bibb. So this next item is what I just explained. You know, uh, different pigments are going to absorb different wavelengths, but what's not absorbed is reflected, and that's what you see as different colors. So different pigments absorb specific wavelengths, but they reflect what you see. What you see is what they reflect, and that's what gives them different colors. So we're going to summarize here some of what's on this uh, slide that we've already gone over, but uh, we're going to be adding some additional characteristics here. So we're just going to list the distinguishing characteristics of algae. In other words, how do we distinguish different species of algae from each other? Well, the first thing is the number of cells. Are they unicellular? Are they colonial? Or are they, are they multicellular? And we'll be getting into what the difference is between colonial and multicellular later on. But that's one distinguishing characteristic. Do they have a cell wall? Not all algae have cell walls. <clears throat> and those that do have cell walls, <coughs> pardon me, it's either going to be made up of cellulose or silica. Cellulose being the same substance that makes up the cell walls of plants. But silica is is uh, like sand. Sand is silica, and we use sand to make glass. So silica cell walls are clear. 
And uh, like in the lab, you're looking at diatoms. Diatoms have silica cell walls. And when you look at that slide, it looks like a bunch of broken glass. That's because silica is basically glass. Third, <clears throat> the third thing is color. And that comes from the whatever photosynthetic pigments they're using. So the pigments either absorb certain wavelengths or reflect and reflect other wavelengths. And it's what you what they reflect is what you see as their color. So different algaes are going to be different colors because they have different pigments. Locomotion. A lot of these algaes are able to swim around. Not all of them, but some of them have flagella and are able to swim. Finally, um, the another characteristic that we look at to distinguish different algaes is what how they store their energy. So they're all photosynthesizing, but there are ways of storing the, uh, you know, photosynthesis results in the production of carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates can be stored as starch, but they can also be converted into oil. So some of these algaes are storing their photosynthetic product their, uh, uh, as starch, their energy as starch, and that's what plants do. And some of them are storing them as oils. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, oil is lighter than water and it uh, helps some of these algaes float. So this is a pretty wild image. I haven't said anything about it yet, but it's, um, these are diatoms. So the, these are those species of algae that have silica cell walls and look like glass. Now they don't look like glass in this image because this is a scanning electron micrograph uh, and it's colorized. So if you'll recall, electron microscopy usually produces a, color, a, a figure or a, an image that is not in color, so it, but it can be colorized after it's produced. Um, and these are diatoms, unicellular diatoms, and you can see how intricate their silica cell walls are. You know, these things are teeny tiny, and they have all these intricate patterns in their cell walls, um, but it's made of silica. And so these look like glass. So let's introduce the uh, three phyla of the microalgae. Because again, we're starting with microalgae and then we'll move on to the macroalgae. Um, so we consider, we're going to consider three phyla. The first phylum is Euglenophyta. Euglena, which literally translates to true eye. Whenever you see that prefix U, E U, that means true. And glena refers to eye. So when you look at these guys under the microscope, this is Euglena, um, this, the, you can see a spot here, and that's what they consider to be an eye. Uh, but it's an eye spot. It's not a true eye. So even though their name is true eye, that eye spot is not really a true eye. But this is Euglena, phylum Euglenophyta. Next we have phylum Chrysophyta. These are the golden algae, and when you look at these images, all three of these are the golden algae, are chrysophytes, um, and you can see why they call them golden, because they look a little bit more golden than, than the green that we see here in Euglena. So this is phylum chrysophyta, and again, that goes for all three of these images. Um, within the phylum chrysophyta are the diatoms, so that image we were looking at on the previous sli slide, those are diatoms. Uh, Cynedra here is diatoms, and then this is a what we call a, a strewn, a bunch of different species just kind of strewn onto a, a slide, um, and these are all diatoms. And they're in the class Bas Bas Basilaria Facaea. Basilaria Facaea. Um, so those are the diatoms. Phylum Chrysophyta, class Basilaria Facaea which is a mouthful. And then the third phylum is dinoflagellata, the dinoflagellates, represented here by serratium. Um, and I gave you both a drawing of serratium along with a, an actual image, and you're looking at all of these in the lab, like it says here, all these algal species are the ones, are, are ones that you're looking at in the lab. So uh, you're looking, when you, when you see the preserved specimens of serratium, you're seeing them as uh, kind of a bluish green because they're stained bluish green. So it's not going to look like this. This is their actual, this is a, an actual living serratium. Um, and then from the drawing, you can see the flagella. So you can see the groove in their cell wall. They have cell walls made of cellulose and they have a groove in their cell wall. And then within that groove is a, is a flagellum. 
So I, I just included the drawing here so you can see the, that they have flagella, and that's why they're known as dinoflagellates, dinoflagellata. So the first phylum of microalgae we'll take a look at is euglena, and again, euglena means true eye, named for its eye spot. So let's go ahead and label that. There's the eye spot. Really what you're seeing when you, you're looking at the eye spot or what you can see the eye spot on euglena is actually a pigment shield over the eye spot uh, to help protect the eye spot and shield it from light and also allow the organism to sense the direction of light. So that's what it's really good for. It can sense light intensity and direction so that these guys can either sw can swim either towards the light or away from the light depending on how intense the light is you know because they want a certain light intensity too much light is not good too little light is not good for photosynthesis and that movement either toward or away from light is known as phototaxis photo light and taxis is the movement movement the behavior of movement either toward or away from something um, so these guys show phototaxis they're a one-celled organism, but they show behavior, phototaxis being one, one uh, example of their behavior. And it points out here what's harmful about too much light, too intense light, is too much ultraviolet radiation, UV, ultraviolet. That's the same thing that we, we need to be concerned with when we go out into the sun. That's why you want to wear sunscreen, because ultraviolet radiation can damage DNA and cause skin cancer. So in the diagram here, the chloroplasts are these guys. They look a little different than the chloroplasts we've seen in other diagrams. So different species can have, you know, the chloroplasts can be somewhat different, um, have evolved to become a little bit different. Like animal-like protists, uh, the protozoa, in other words, euglena can be heterotrophic. So you'll notice here that the flagella are coming out of this region here that is actually a gullet. So just like we saw, like when we were looking at uh, paramecium and how paramecium feeds, it pulls uh, food into its oral groove and funnels it into its gullet and then phagocytizes that food in it from its gullet. Uh, euglena can do the same thing. So euglena has the best of both worlds. It can be both autotrophic and heterotrophic. It can both photosynthesize and eat things, which is a great trick, and I, I wish we could do that. Something else that is animal-like about um, euglena is that they don't have a cell wall. So again, some of these algaes have a cell wall and some don't. Euglena is one that does not have a cell wall, but it does have uh, it ha does have a toughened plasma membrane. So in other words, it's kind of reinforced its plasma membrane to be this tough, flexible covering that we call a pellicle. So this label is for the whole outer surrounding plasma membrane of the euglena is this tough uh, pellicle. They also have contractile vacuoles. So if you look in the diagram, you might, might recognize the contractile vacuole here because it looks like the contractile vacuole that we've seen in other diagrams. There it is right there. Um, and they use that for, if you'll recall, osmoregulation because these guys are living in fresh water and the water's osmosing into the cell. You know, fresh water is hypotonic and the cytoplasm inside the cell is hypertonic and water is going to osmose from hypotonic to hypertonic solutions because there's a lot of solutes dissolved in the cytoplasm uh, so there's a high concentration of solutes inside the cell a low concentration of solutes outside the cell um, so a high concentration of solutes is what produces a hypertonic solution so another way you can think of that is that water follows solute Water is going to go to the solution that has a high concentration of solute, and that's a hypertonic solution. So these guys need to pump out water, so they have contractile vacuoles to do that, and that's a form of osmoregulation. That's the same thing your kidneys do for you, osmoregulate. Like I already mentioned, uh, you glean to have a, a pair of flagella here, and they use the flagella not only for locomotion, but also for uh, feeding. So if they're going to eat something, if they're not photosynthesizing and they need to eat something, they're going to use their flagella to try to capture food, food items. Um, but what I'm pointing out here is that uh, if you'll recall, prokaryotes, bacteria can have flagella too, but the bacterial flagellum, the prokaryotic flagellum, is different. Uh, it's structurally different and, it, and it's functionally different too than the flagella that we see in uh, eukaryotic cells, including sperm cells. The flagella of eukaryotes 
is either going to twirl, like in the in the case of Euglena, they, it twirls, but it doesn't spin, it twirls. Um, and in other eukaryotes, like sperm cells, it, it fla uh, kind of wags back, back and forth, like a, like a swimming fish. Um, but in prokaryotes, it rotates, it actually spins like a propeller. Um, and then finally, uh, euglenoids, euglena, um, those in the phylum Euglenophyta store their energy in granules that contain a starch-like carbohydrate. So it's you can consider it starch basically, but it's a, it's a specific kind of starch called paramylon. So you'll notice that there are these granules in this diagram, and those are storage compartments, uh, vacuoles that are con that contain para paramylon, carbohydrate storage bodies, storing paramylon. That's how it stores its energy. So when it photosynthesizes, it makes carbohydrate, and that carbohydrate is stored in the form of paramylon. paramylon. And finally, when these guys reproduce, they reproduce by mitotic binary fission, just like we saw in, in uh, the protozoa, the animal-like protists. Um, and we see that in a lot of the algae, but some of the algae can uh, also reproduce sexually. And we'll be looking at that when we get to those algae.